What's going on, everybody? It's your buddy. It's your pal, Spaz Phoenix, the YWC Reality Check, and this is your... What? A raw review? You haven't gone back in time. Uh, nothing's really changed on this channel. I'm not going to go back to every pay-per-view, every Monday Night Raw. Most of my videos are still going to be topical videos. I'm doing this raw review right now because I feel like it. And because I can, I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things before we move on. If you haven't, go back to last night's uh, review of Battleground. Uh, it's Battleground, and I will say it again. Best pay-per-view of this year so far. Um... Other than the main event, obviously, but the main event had John Cena in it, so it is what it is. Um, go back a couple of videos, those of you that are becoming really, really rabid fans of the Ask the Phoenix series, you guys have four more days till the 25th of every month to put your questions in the comment section of the last Ask the Phoenix video if you want to be part of the next one. It really is... It really is that easy. It's ridiculous o'clock in the morning because, you know, we're in Canada and Raw ends at 11 and then other things happen and it's ridiculous o'clock. This was a really good Raw. This Raw, in combination with Battleground, makes me very, very anticipatory about uh, SummerSlam. How's that for uh, stretching the, um, the means of vocabulary? Anticipatory. Let's just go with that. Triple H opens the show talking about how he's mad about Cena winning the title. And then he starts mocking the IWC. He says, I'm so mad, I'm going to write a tweet. And I'm going to go on Vine. And I'm going to go on this and that. And he names all the different types of social media. He doesn't mention YouTube. So uh, you, me, and everybody else in the YWC are safe. And he doesn't mention Facebook, which is ironic. And then he starts mocking the fans and say, I'm just not... I'm just not going to go to the show anymore. Yada, yada. Wait a minute, I have all the power. I can do whatever I want. And as a great man once said, I guarantee John Cena will not be the champion after SummerSlam. So later tonight, he's going to announce who John Cena's opponent is for SummerSlam, as if it hasn't been telegraphed a mile away. He's going to make that announcement later tonight. We have various people come out, and those various people are Randy Orton, who's pissed off he never got his one-on-one -on -one rematch against Daniel Bryan after WrestleMania, which is entirely true. I mean, Daniel Bryan went and became a slinky and fucked off, and entered John Cena. I mean, they're kind of interchangeable at this point, aren't they? But uh, Kane comes out and says he's start tired of babysitting Randy Orton, which is pretty legit. And Roman Reigns is Roman Reigns, so he just decides to show up and spoil the party. Um, hits a Superman punch on Kane out of the entire group. He's the one that gets a punch. Yeah, it's not going to be Orton. It's not going to be Triple H. Ro Roman Reigns versus Triple H is going to happen eventually. But what we do get is Triple H setting up a handicap match, Roman Reigns versus Kane and Randy Orton, which there's two things I want to say, and they might sound contradictory, but it really is true. Roman Reigns looks like a boss in this whole match, but this match is very, very, like, nails on the chalkboard, annoyingly average for three main eventers. Spear on Kane, Roman Reigns gets the win. Is anybody really surprised? We hear that we are going to get Bray Wyatt on the highlight reel. My, in my initial thought is, ooh, how the hell is that going to work? That's going to be a brawl. It's going to be something that's going to set up to something that's going to set up to SummerSlam. And it's going to be all, you know, tickety-poo, um, paint by numbers all the way to SummerSlam. That's what I thought was going to happen. Let's uh, let's see what happens on the highlight reel. Nikki Bella comes out for a four-on-one Divas handicap match against Eva Marie, Cameron, Alicia Fox, and Rosa Mendez. She goes out into the crowd looking like she's hugging a fan. And it turns out to be Brie. Stephanie comes out cuts this really, really good promo on on Brie. Tells her how it was a dumb idea to quit just to protect her boyfriend's job considering he's, you know, gimpy at home and not doing anything and not part of the company either. Really big choice there. Now you get to see firsthand what uh, your actions have caused your sister Brie, or sorry, your sister Nikki, rather. And um, Nikki calls her a bitch and everybody goes, ooh, the guy, I, got, I have to say this. The guy behind her in the crowd has to be a plant. He has to be. Like, there's nobody... I mean, yes, everybody smiles when they hear somebody say bitch on TV because we're all we're all immature at heart. We're all about five years old at heart when we're watching wrestling. That's how you suspend your disbelief. But the guy 
literally does the cliche, you know, she's a Stephanie or a bitch. She's like, ooh! And it's like, really? And, like, not to be racist, but on top of that, he was white. Like, I mean, <laughs> come on! It was pretty cool, though. Um, he, She says uh, something to the effect of, you're picking on my sister because I left a handprint on your face. You're a vindictive bitch. She says bitch again. The guy behind her, ooh! Makes me laugh. The guy was way too animated, so he was either a plant or he was fucking wasted. Either way, and he gets to sit next to Brie Bella. So, all in all, front row seats sitting next to Nikki Bella, possibly wasted at a Monday Night Raw taping. I might go, ooh, if I could do all that. Maybe I, maybe I shouldn't be judging the guy. I do ramble. I don't know why you guys come here half the time. <laughs> but, um,. Call Stephanie a vindictive bitch. Stephanie slaps um, Brie and has her ejected from the arena. And then looks up into the ring at all the girls that are watching this happen and says, Let this be a message. Ring the bell. Nikki proceeds to get the living snot kicked out of him, clear, out of her, clearly, because it's four on one. And because it's Stephanie and Stephanie wins, lol. Nikki outside the ring after the match. It's like, you're going to keep enduring things like this until you quit like your sister did because this is your sister's fault. She quit, yada, yada, yada. What I would really, really love to see come out of this, and WWE is never going to give me this in a million years, but at SummerSlam, because right now, because of something that happens later on in the night that I will get to later in the night, I want Nikki to leverage an I quit match oh, mm, mm, mm. between Stephanie McMahon and herself and put a stipulation on it where okay Stephanie if you make me quit I will quit along with Brie you'll never see the other one of us again if I make you quit you hire Brie back have it <laughs> an I quit match between Stephanie McMahon and Nikki Bella if you had told me a year ago that I would be on this video following logic and actually wanting that to happen, I would have laughed at you. But yes, Survivor Series, Nikki Bella versus Stephanie McMahon, I quit match with Brie Bella's contract on the line. And I'll get to the other part of that when it becomes relevant. Bo Dallas comes out to face Damian Sandow and... This was a good match. I mean, I like both guys. Sandow's coming out as a basketball player, which is eh, running down. They were in Miami, which is why we're getting Flo Rida later in the night, which I could really do without. But Bo Dallas is coming. We don't even get a Bo Leave promo, which is kind of sad. We get Damian Sandow coming out as, I don't know basketball guys. LeBron James apparently left Miami, went to Cleveland. To which JBL, on commentary, says, nobody is from Cleveland. And Michael Cole corrects him and says, well, no, LeBron James is obviously from Cleveland. So is The Miz. So is Dolph Ziggler. So your current Intercontinental Champion as of last night, and a former multiple-time world champion in your own company, are from no, nobody's from Cleveland. Fantastic. Uh, JBL believes it's fantastic. I don't know... Who? I like both guys. I think this is a great match. But the logic behind this, I don't know who I'm supposed to boo in this match. Because Bo Dallas is a fantastic heel that I want to cheer because he's a fantastic heel. And Damian Sandow is a heel that I like, that's talented in the ring, that's getting buried. So my gut reaction is to cheer for both guys. Damian Sandow looks more aggressive in this match than we've seen him in a while. But because Bo Dallas is the new guy and Bo Dallas is, you know, the sarcastic incarnation of everything John Cena, Bodog gets the win. I think I think the Bodog works. I didn't like it when I first saw it because it's basically he's doing a stratisfaction out of the corner, which is kind of awkward, but it's goofy and effective which is basically what his character is, which is goofy and effective. Does that make sense? He gets the Bodog, he gets the win off of LeBron James Do Dow. Hmm. Anyways, then we get the graphic on TV. I don't have the WWE app. I did for a while. It was a fun little novelty, but I honestly and truly wish I had turned it on, even just for this one commercial break, because it led into this into this next segment. We get the graphic up. You know, coming up next. 
the highlight reel featuring Bray Wyatt. We come back, there is the highlight reel set up in the ring, the Geratron 5, the very expensive Geratron 5000, as it's been come to known, uh, is in the ring with the chairs, and they, I don't know why they put a rug down when there's, when there's a, when there's a talk show segment. It, it just, I, I, it, does anybody care about the rug? I'm just putting it up. I get the chairs thing. I can forgive the chairs even though nobody sits down because that's a talk show thing. I, can, I, I love the Jerichon 5000 only because when Jericho's a heel, he just sits there and brags about it like it's the greatest thing ever. Even though history will tell you that the Jerichon 5000 doesn't exist anymore because it got met by Shawn Michaels' skull and eyes when they had their rivalry way back in the day. But again, that's when Jericho punched Shawn Michaels' wife. And I, I digress. But <laughs> the Cheritron 5000 and the chairs and the rug and everything that would indicate that we're about to have a highlight reel is there. But you don't hear Break the Walls Down. You don't see the pyro. You don't see the light up jacket. You do see lights. You see Bray Wyatt's lantern and the jump cut and Bray Wyatt inviting himself to the ring talking about why is there no Jericho? Why isn't Jericho out here? Why isn't he here to save us? Where is your savior, everybody? Oh, where could he be? Looks up at the Titan drive. And they show an exclusive from the app, which, unless the definition of exclusive has changed, makes it no longer an exclusive. Just saying. <laughs> Grammar. English. <laughs> um, apparently Jericho was getting interviewed in the back for the app, and the, the Wyatts invaded his dressing room. He got a 3 on one beatdown complete with a truly gross looking Sister Abigail into the locker door. Hold on to that thought. Bray Wyatt comes out, cuts a hell of a promo after looking at this video where he stands over Chris Jericho and says sooner or later they all fall down. Sister Abigail, uh, like I say, to the locker and then he comes out and says, you know, since we've walked into the WWE, we've defeated heroes and monsters and I think he said phenoms, I could be wrong, but um, we've defeated giants and superstars and this and that and the next thing. And he says, who the hell do you think you're dealing with, man? And the best part of all this, he gets to the end and it's, and it's sort of a cliche that everybody has heard before, but he says, after the match last night, I remember something that Abigail used to tell me. She said, be careful, Bray when you go looking for vengeance because you'll have to dig two graves one for your opponent and one for yourself Jericho unfortunately for you I am forever follow the buzzards I just I shake my head at everybody that turns away Bray Wyatt as somebody that just sits there and churns out drivel, which is a lot of what people have been saying recently. Oh, he's just rambling about nonsense. He's really not. His promos are fucking brilliant. And, you know, we don't even have anything else, but we know they're going to fight again at some point. You know, do you want this war? I created war. And I've, you know, the whole, I want this war. I created war. It takes me right back to the very first um, altercation between the Wyatts and the Shield, and that's that's just a good place to be, isn't it? When they went face to face for the first time, crowd chanting, "This is awesome!" vehemently, the same way they did when Wyatt and Jericho were face to face for the first time. This is awesome, vehemently, and this going into SummerSlam will be fantastic. If this doesn't propel Bray Wyatt to an eventual title shot, at least, then WWE is wasting their time. But in the meantime, it's awesome. Flo Rida is seen arriving in the back. He's hugging Ziggler and Kofi and Big E and some of the, not the Funkadactyls anymore, but Naomi and some other people that are back there. We get the Miz versus Dolph Ziggler. <laughs> As a result of the ending of the of the battleground battle royal last night, I have to say, I have to say, my boy the Miz, with his white suit. I'm just saying, um, the white suit that matches the white intercontinental championship and the black shades and uh, 
I would love to have a single match where somebody comes down to the ring in sunglasses and one of the commentators doesn't say, oh, he must think his future's so bright he wears sunglasses at night. Yes, it's a musical reference. Yes, it's an incredibly dated musical reference. And yes, I get that you're all old and think you're funny. But uh, commentators, especially Jerry Lawler, I defend you guys a lot. Stop making me look like a tool. Just saying. But uh, Miz versus Ziggler, non-title match. I was about to say non-title match for the Intercontinental Championship, which is which is which doesn't make any sense at all. It is a non-title match between the Intercontinental Champion and Dolph Ziggler. Um, I'm just going to go bullet points for what's stuck. I'm not going to run through any matches, you know, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. If you want that kind of long, prolonged, unnecessariness, go over to Mark Pearson's channel. I don't do that. Um, the whole the whole psychology, the whole overdone gimmick right now that Miz is doing where he wants to avoid his moneymaker getting hit. He wants to avoid getting hit in the face to the point where he reminds the referee at the beginning of the match, he can't hit me in the face, which is obviously not true. Dolph Ziggler and the shower of elbow drops is always good. I don't like the fact that every single time he does it, JBL calls it the heart stopper and starts making fun of Jerry Lawler's heart attack in Montreal. If Jerry Lawler wants to make... Okay, here's a differential I'm going to make here. Jerry Lawler is the one that had the heart attack. And yes, we all know Jerry Lawler has a phenomenal sense of humor, especially about himself and the things that have happened to him in his career. If Jerry Lawler wants to make a joke and say, that's painful to watch, it takes me back to Montreal... I'm okay with that, because he's poking fun at himself, so we know that the person that it's about thinks it's okay, because he's the one saying, I don't like JBL hammering at home constantly, because it's forced. And, you know, bad things happen in Montreal, I don't know. Um, there's a really, really nice hotshot maneuver that Miz does to Ziggler. Uh, in this match. They're both fighting on the apron way. So they're, they're here. Here's the rope and here's both of them behind the rope. He lifts up um, Ziggler as normally a hot shot in the ring. You see they get lift up they get you know clotheslined on the top ring uh, ring rope or whatever and it's a pretty effective move because you get a little bit of a whiplash and it usually transitions into your next move. This was a hot shot across the outside of the apron which met Dolph Ziggler's face on the top of the ring post and led to him falling out of the ring. So not only was he in a precarious position on the ring apron, not only was he being lifted up by Miz, who was on the same precarious position, he then impacted his entire face on the top of the ring post and then fell to the floor. For somebody that ragdolls like Dolph Ziggler, this was a hell of a spot to see and a spot that I would expect to see at a pay-per-view not on Raw, if I'm completely honest. Um, Miz makes me mark out being a Hardy fan because he, start, he, once again, is using the side effect, which is nice. We get a pair of DDTs. We get a pair of signature DDTs. We get Ziggler's jumping DDT, which is fantastic, because Ziggler pauses in time when he does his DDT. When he jumps up, and he almost looks like he's riding the person's shoulder for a second, and then drops them down. Um, after a little bit of back and forth, Miz comes back with his from the knees DDT, where he takes you out at the legs, and then gives you a nice, jerky, short DDT, and it also looks fantastic. Figure four. Figure four is successfully applied by the Miz after the third attempt. The first two attempts at the figure four get reversed into, um, into roll-up pinning type scenarios by Dolph Ziggler. The third time, it does get applied, which I'm sure anybody that reads the uh, the YWC rulebook or anybody that follows Wrestling 101 is going to bitch, oh my god, how can you do Ric Flair's move, yada yada yada, and I laugh at all of you. And then we have a great uh, counter sequence to end the match, which goes from a potential zigzag to a potential skull crushing finale to a successful zigzag and a win. Ziggler wins. Please Please, I'm begging you, let this lead to an Intercontinental Championship match at SummerSlam between Dolph Ziggler and The Miz. So now, we have an, uh, an I Quit match between Nikki Bella and Stephanie McMahon. Yes, I'm sticking with that. We have Dolph Ziggler versus The Miz for the Intercontinental Championship. SummerSlam looks pretty good so far. 
Triple H tells Rollins that he doesn't want to name Rollins as the competitor for John Cena at SummerSlam. Why would he? Why would you force yourself into that spot? You have the briefcase. It gives you the advantage. You have this and that and the next thing. Um, Rollins talks about Ambrose for a second. He says, I, I could wait and cash in my money in the bank, but every time I do, Ambrose is going to be there to fuck it up, more or less. Cesaro comes in, you know, magically a wild Cesaro appears. Um, says he, Cesaro is best for business because he knows that that's what Triple H looks for. He is no longer associated with Paul Heyman, which is a big bomb that he brushes off kind of casually, which I think is kind of funny. He now wants to be a Triple H guy. Triple H, who's looking for everybody to impress him tonight, makes Cesaro versus Ambrose, and I'm like, oh, fucking yes, this needs to be the main event. Fine, wonderful. We get... Natalia Neidhart and Emma versus my new favorite team of PJ. Oh, yes. Um, we see a replay of the... Basically, we see a replay of all the high points of their match at Battleground, which is kind of funny, because usually when they do um, shots from the night before at a pay-per-view, especially if it's right the night after, it's usually in stills, but they, they did most of this actually in video, which is nice, and I guess they're not, they don't think they're losing anything because everybody's got the network, and America's the only thing that exists, and we don't have it up here yet, and any, anyways, I digress. So, Paige A versus, uh, Natty and Emma, starts off with a CM Punk chance, but, uh, Paige, when she gets in with Emma, starts with the wicked headbutts, and I really... I like the headbutt from Paige because she's small, she's kind of dainty, she's pale. I don't mean dainty in, in a weakened kind of way, but there's not much to her. The girl could afford to, you know, have a burger every now and then. But she's not the type of person that you would expect to be delivering massive headbutts in a ring. So it's, it's cool when she does do it. Um... Um, 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 while they're wrestling, Natty knocks her own tag team partner off the apron and locks Paige in the sharpshooter. Paige, while in the sharpshooter, tags in AJ. Natty, I guess, doesn't see it. She hits the Shining Wizard on Natalia. Uh, uh, AJ hits the Shining Wizard on Natalia, who's still focused on having Paige in the sharpshooter, which obviously frees Paige. Um, Shining, uh, I said the Shining Wizard, didn't I? It would help if I didn't trip over my own words. Natty, getting up from receiving the Shining Wizard, there we go, uh, is prime position for the Black Widow, and PJ gets the win. I really, if I'm honest, and yes, I know, I'm a Canadian, and I'm a bad Canadian, I really like any diva getting a submission victory on Natalia Neidhart. Is it, does that make me a bad guy? Does that make me a bad guy? Also, Deluxe Man is a fucking moron saying that P uh, Paige and AJ need to have a submission match at, Savar at SummerSlam, which is fine. I actually agree with that idea. They have to have a submission match at, at SummerSlam because they're the only divas that have submission. No. No, there's definitely the sharpshooter. There's definitely the Emma Lock. There's definitely... Oh, uh, what the... F Fuck is the move that Layla does. I can't think of it right now. Um, but yeah, typecasting these two women as the only women that have submission moves is a pretty dumb move, Alex. Pretty dumb. I hope your students are smarter than you. I'm just saying. But they're posing and they're hugging and they're about to leave when Paige... And, and, and I don't want to sound like like a gross guy here right now, but Paige goes from smiling to this ridiculously evil smirk and just licks her lips and grabs AJ by the back of the head and throws her head into the match. And then, remember what I said before about the headbutts? From the, from the Thez Press mount position, headbutts straight down on AJ, mounted headbutts over and over and over again, tosses her out of the ring from rail to apron to rail to apron, makes her eat ring post harder than you would perceive a diva would, and then throws her over the table into the announce booth. Um, yes, please. Yes, more of this. More of this, absolutely. And the whole time she's just screaming the same thing she screamed the night that she lost her title was that this is my house now. And I like that. I also like keeping that that mm, evil, sadistic smirk on her face while skipping up the ramp the way AJ does to her music. It, it, it's so... 
It's so it's it's more good. It's better than it should be. It's better than anybody expects from the Divas division right now for sure. Months and months and months ago when AJ left and I was still talking about we're going to get Paige and AJ. We're going to get Paige and AJ and everybody laughed at me or most people did anyway. It's like Punk left. The company screwed Punk over so many times. He's gone. He's married to AJ. They just made her drop her belt to a newbie. What makes you think she's going to come back? You know, toss that out. It's a pipe dream. Pass the pipe. Because the dream is happening. And suck it. Just saying. Moving on. We have Fandango versus Zack Ryder. Which is where we continue the theme of Summer Rae and Layla coming out with whoever is facing Fandango, which I think is great, because he's just getting more and more frustrated, and when he does snap, he's going to take somebody out. I really, again, with the hoping and the wishing and the me being more creative than WWE probably, I hope this makes Fandango snap to the point where he says, fuck this Fandango bullshit. Hi, by the way, I'm Johnny Curtis and I'm about to kick your ass. This needs to happen. Fandango gets pissed. He's trying to have an aggressive match with Zack Ryder. Zack Ryder gets the Rough Rider, get, goes for the pin. Fandango actually has his foot up on the rope, which Layla knocks off, and yeah. Also, Layla and Summer Rae blatantly, blatantly ripping off uh, the beautiful people with the whole, we're gonna kiss, we're gonna kiss, we're gonna kiss, no we're not. Um, Renee Young interviews Flo Rider in the back. He jokingly says, maybe I should toss my hat in the ring for a match against John Cena. Now, normally I would think that's really lame. I have no use for Flo Rider whatsoever. I have no use for that type of music whatsoever. But there's a little bit of dichotomy and truth in there because in Miami was round one of Rock versus Cena at WrestleMania 28 in Miami when The Rock won and Flo Rida was the one that sang The Rock to the ring. So, Yes, I'm willing to accept that little that little dig at Cena because of the historical significance of it and somebody who's not a wrestler coming along and pulling a David Arquette on John Cena. That idea just makes me smile a whole bunch. Then he gets confronted by Jack or by, by Heath Slater, sorry. And did I miss did I miss something? Guys, did I miss something? Um Maybe not. He gets confronted by Slater, who references WrestleMania 28, and when he tried to get in Flo Rida's face and he got shoved down, whatever, he tries to get in Flo Rida's face and gets shoved down again. This is the guy that eliminated Cesaro from the Intercontinental Championship Battle Royal, guys. I'm just saying. Um, we get back to the ring after the break, and Stephanie McMahon announces Flo Rida. Flo Rida sings. Great. Same shit that he played at WrestleMania two years ago. But then, oh yes, while she's thanking Flo Rida for his performance, she is accosted at ringside by the police, who inform her that she slapped Brie Bella, which in the city of Miami, and I'm pretty sure everywhere else as well, because they're not too special down there, that that is considered battery, and she is under arrest. She loses her shit in the very, very billion dollar princess way of, don't you know who I am? You can't do this to me. I'm gonna have your badge and your badge and your badge and your badge. And, you know, she hit me first and it's self-defense. It's self-defense from three months ago, maybe. Uh, Stephanie McMahon, when she goes like from billion dollar princess, smiley, snooty, bragging about everything to million dollar princess temper tantrum when she's not getting her way is fantastic and as far as that as far as Stephanie McMahon losing her shit and just being a bitch and being her father's daughter oh yes so much yes give me that I quit match with Nikki Bella I can't believe these words are coming out of my mouth guys uh, da -da 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 -da. Um, we see her getting dra dragged through the back, and she's now gone from flipping out and threatening everybody to crying and telling Triple H how, uh, how scared she is and whatnot. And, I mean, Stephanie McMahon is great to look at, at the best of, in the best of times, but the way they were pushing her around, her dress looked very, I won't say bad, but a little awkward. And, you know, Stephanie McMahon in handcuffs, if I'm going to start talking about that, this is going to be an entirely new channel. 
Moving on, Triple H says he's got Jimmy on the line and he's going to fix everything. I'm assuming, and they say in the next match that there is actually somebody named Jimmy on the legal staff of WWE, which is kind of funny that they would go that far to acknowledge that. But we come back from break and Triple H is in the back with one of the road agents. One of the road agents is a very, very bald Joey Mercury who uh, says, well, how, how are you going to leave? How are you going to go uh, help out Steph when you have this big announcement to make? And he's, Triple H says, it's my wife, God damn it, Family first. But, I mean, they're, they're going to take a while to sign her in, right? And then she's going to be printed and processed, and that's going to take a while. I mean, I don't have to be there right away. I mean, go out and get the car ready, and I'll make my announcement, and then I'll catch up with her. Which is fantastic. Triple H just being a scumbag. I, I love this Raw. Rybaxel versus Kofi Kingston and Big E. The only interesting thing about this at all, and you guys know I'm not even a fan of big guy matches, but the only interesting thing about this is Ryback versus Big E. Kofi Kingston looks sloppy as fuck in this match, including a very sloppy attempt at an SOS. Kofi attempts a crossbody, which Ryback, I think, had to move to one side to catch properly and counter into a very, very lame and easily picked up... Um, small package for the win. There was a little bit of a jump cut in the feed that I was watching, and but all of a sudden we have Xavier Woods in a suit, kind of looking like um, brother, it's, it, it kind of looked like a brother love suit, which is awkward, but he's cutting a promo about we're not going to be clowns for them anymore, and we're not going to dance because they've told us to dance. It's our time now. We're going to stop asking for stuff, and we're going to start taking it. For the love of God, Please don't let this be WWE's version of MVP Kenny King and Bobby Lashley. We just, we don't, we don't need it. Please don't make this a black thing is another thing I'm going to say. And for the love of God, Kofi Kingston as a heel. Kofi Kingston already has no dimension. Please don't prove that even more by making him a heel if this is... Oh... Oh my god. Let them get squashed by the Wyatts. That, that's okay. That I can deal with. Um, speaking of squashes, Rusev squashed the Great Kali because he can. I got nothing. Ambrose versus Cesaro. I want you to see in my notes here when I wrote Ambrose versus Cesaro. There's no notes. I spent way too much time watching this match. I spent way too much time watching Ambrose be a psychopath and watching uh, Cesaro manhandle him. This was a great match, building to what felt like a great crescendo, which made me think later on down the line if Cesaro is going to be another Triple H guy. This could be a match at a pay-per-view, but eventually uh, Ambrose just loses it and says fuck the match, clocks him with a chair, which 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 is fine. I'm I'm okay with that. So, um, Ambrose. Triple H comes out to make his announcement. Please let me announce to you the next number one contender for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Orton comes out. Before he can even make it halfway down the ramp, the old Shield slash Roman Reigns music starts. He comes in. He chases Orton out of the building. Heyman, quietly as you like, walks out on the stage, says, Excuse me, Mr. COO. Please let me submit to you the following. Your plan A is Orton. I like it. But he's not going to get the title as long as he's dealing with Roman Reigns. Rollins is your plan B, and he's got Ambrose up his ass being psycho, blocking every cash-in he possibly can. Let me please present to you option C. And out comes Brock Lesnar. There's a long stare down because Triple H and Heyman don't like each other. And it's obvious. Triple H and Lesnar despise each other. And it's obvious. But it all ends in handshakes. Triple H leaves the ring. And Heyman grabs the mic as only Heyman can. Talks about Brock Lesnar. Talks about the greatness of John Cena. Talks about the 15 title reigns in 10 years of John Cena. And how that sounds to him like something that should be conquered, much like his client Brock Lesnar conquered The Undertaker's undefeated streak at WrestleMania, making him the one behind the one in 21 and 1 and the manager of the new number one contender. He goes on to rip John Cena. He, why? why? There we go. He's, he talks about the two-sided John Cena fan base, how 
you know, most of you who ha still have bedtimes and get tucked in by mommy and daddy would like to stand up and chant as you do, let's go Cena, and how everybody that doesn't have a bedtime anymore stands more fervent and says that Cena sucks. Brock Lesnar doesn't care about any of that, and Brock Lesnar does not care about the malpracticing doctor of thugonomics, which is fucking fantastic. Um goes on to say that Brock Lesnar is not your typical villain. Brock Lesnar is not going to walk into the ring and say, hey, John, why don't you just skip this beat down? Why don't you just lay the title at my feet and run away? He's not going to get that. He plays the mania clip and he says, this is what happens when, when Brock Lesnar sees something that he needs to conquer. Shows the mania clip, shows Brock Lesnar ending the streak, all the, all the shock and awe of the fans, etc. Compares them to John Cena. And then talks about how even the heartless Vince McMahon... <laughs> it's fucking brilliant. Even the heartless chairman of the board hopped into the ambulance after that match to care about the well-being of a dead man after being conquered by the conqueror Brock Lesnar, who is going to punch, hurt, mangle, F5, strip, and conquer John Cena at SummerSlam. SummerSlam right now, on my TV, right now, fucking yes, this is WWE on a roll, all the, eh, the naysayers, all the people that hate WWE just because it's something to do, and all of you that are still sucking the Daniel Bryan dick, you guys are beyond helping, and if I can quote Bray Wyatt, you are beyond saving, this all of this, even the stupid stuff is good right now. The fact, like I said, John Cena versus um, Brock Lesnar, we're going to get either Orton or Triple H versus Roman Reigns, we're going to get friggin' uh, Rollins versus Ambrose, we're going to get Miz versus Ziggler, and I am here on this channel where I have verbally castrated the Bella Twins over and over and over again, begging the WWE at this point for an I quit match between Nikki Bella and Stephanie McMahon. Oh yes, please, SummerSlam is on the horizon. Please, bring me that horizon. Turn sail, turn the, turn the steering wheel, adjust your sails, set a course, for SummerSlam. I want it now. I want it on my TV. I am way too excited right now for this. Anyways, guys, like I say, go back, ask the Phoenix, add your questions, etc. Uh, go back, check out my, my uh, Battleground review. Let, let me tell you one more time why I think it is the best pay-per-view that WWE has given us in 2014. I'm out of breath. I'm out of time. It's stupid o'clock in the morning. It's past ridiculous. It's now at stupid o'clock in the morning. There, there are increments. But that being said, the clock has struck midnight. I've been Spazzy or YWC Reality Check. Subscribe up there. Talk down there. Start a conversation. Keep all these conversations going on. What do you think about this glorious snowball we call the WWE right now? Don't be a stranger. I'll talk to each and every last one of you later. But for right now, I'm tagging out. Bye, guys.